if someone asks me, Inge, what is your profession? I find it very difficult to answer because I've done so many different jobs. You know, I was a project manager, a product manager, a researcher, an R&D coordinator, co-founder of Open Campus, and managing director of a company. And all these tasks, these jobs, were intriguing, demanding, and fulfilling at the same time, and provided new insights and tremendous knowledge that accompanied all my life. Today, I want to go back into my time as a researcher and share one important process of understanding with you. <clears throat> back in the 1990s, I was a junior professor of anthropology and I studied human evolution. And it had occurred to me that the natural history of humans has mostly been reconstructed as a natural history of man. Women didn't come into it very much. And I had just started to develop some ideas to solve the problem when a colleague from Austria called and asked me to give a lecture at a summer school. What is the general theme? I asked. Beautiful new women's world, he said with a question mark. Oh, that sounds interesting. And what topic do you want me to talk about? I thought of if Darwin had been a woman. That sounded interesting. And I spontaneously agreed. But you know, at that time, I had not the slightest idea that this task would turn out to be one of the most interesting and precious processes of understanding for me. To be honest, at first I had no clue how to tackle the topic. I consulted Darwin's biography. Start simple, I thought. And then I decided to literally change Darwin's gender identity. <laughs> so, would the crucial events in Charles C.V. be compatible with the life of my fictitious Charlotte? Charles studied in Edinburgh and Cambridge between 1825 and 1831. And Charlotte? No, women were not admitted to universities in those days. Charles graduated in 1831 in Cambridge. And Charlotte? Again, no, for the same reason. The first women students in Cambridge were examined in 1882, more than 50 years later. The most important event in Charles' professional life was the voyage on the Beagle. From 1831 to 1836, he sailed around the world. He endured storms. He suffered from seasickness. He experienced a heavy earthquake. He collected fossils in rough Patagonia and studied flora and fauna in the Lutheran forest. Before his departure, the 22-year-old Charles had lots of difficulties to get his father's consent. And Charlotte, what do you think? Would her father have given her permission to sail around the world, visit all those places, and share the cabin with a man? Charles was a relatively wealthy man and spent most of his life as a private scholar, a self-funded gentleman scientist in the lab of his family, cared for by his wife, Emma. He did a lot of research and publishing, 
and permanently elaborated his theory of evolution, which he finally published in 1859. So please note the full title. On the origin of species by means of natural selection, or he offers a different title, the preservation of favored races in the struggle for life. His findings were discussed extremely controversially among his contemporaries and caused a lot of hostilities. In 1871, he published his no less controversial book, The Descent of Man and Selection in Relation to Sex. And Charlotte, would she have been able to discover, develop, publish, and defend a theory that has, in retrospect, changed a paradigm? I came to the conclusion that a woman in those days had no chance to develop the theory of evolution. And at this point, I decided to end Charlotte's story. But I had the feeling that my story, my task, was not yet at an end. So again, I consulted the literature, dived into many books and articles. You know, scientists always feel comfortable if they can refer to literature. <laughs> Suddenly, I came across a sentence of John Maynard Smith, a very influential evolutionary biologist in the last quarter of the 20th century. Science is a social construct. This is what he wrote. Science is a social construct? This is very disturbing for a scientist who tries to explore and explain natural phenomena in order to approach an as yet unknown truth. Is this truth influenced by my worldviews, my values, my prejudices, and even my gender identity? And can we identify such influences in Charles Darwin's evolutionary theory? So how did the man, Charles Darwin, look at Mother Nature? Well, unquestionably, Darwin uh, was, he was rethinking nature. He discovered the principle of selection. Uh, of evolution, driven by two different processes, natural selection and sexual selection. Today, almost every child in school is familiar with the concept of natural selection, which has many different aspects. For example, a relatively higher reproduction rate, or the ability to collect and monopolize more food than competitors or to be better camouflaged than conspecifics, or to pretend being dangerous to prevent being eaten. All these examples demonstrate what fitness in an evolutionary sense means, best adaptation to specific environments. But Darwin used the language of his time to describe natural selection. Therefore, he provoked mental images telling a different story. <clears throat> the survival of the fittest turned into survival of the strongest. The struggle for life appeared to be a battlefield of life. And competition turned into combat. So that was the description of a man's world in the 19th century. In addition, it was part of the zeitgeist of industrialization to have a strong belief in the blessings of technology. And therefore, Darwin associated human evolution with technology. Tools became a very important driving force. 
and tools were quickly equated with weapons. Uh, Darwin uh, did not, he, he, well, he was a, he was a very uh, um, open-minded man, but he did not question <clears throat> the, he did not, did not question uh, racism and sexism that were widely spread and generally accepted among his contemporaries. So, in this respect, he was a child of his time, and he even he, he thought women were, were in, inferior, and he even developed an evolutionary explanation for this. This was, uh, <clears throat> men had to defend their families in the struggle for life. And they also had to invent all these splendid tools. And by this way, he paved the way for an evolutionary scenario of man the hunter, which dominated for more than 100 years. Women were just supernumerary actors, or should I say actresses, in the background. Well, Darwin, he changed the paradigm, but he did not question uh, racism and sexism. So I want now to know, is there, uh, at, at this point, I, I suddenly noticed that John Maynard Smith was really right. Science is a social construct. But, you know, at this point, I still had the feeling that my, my story, my task, was not yet at an end. Uh, as yet, I had analyzed the past, the history of the theory. But is it possible that Darwin's prejudice perpetuates until today? In the last 25 years, there has been a lot of research around the concept of sexual selection. Um, and this concept deals with reproductive competition and reproductive choices. Or to phrase it simple, how do individuals find their mating partners and how does this influence evolution? Let me give you an example of the 1990s. A group of researchers were studying pinion jays, a species of birds in California that live and breed in colonies. The researchers observed the birds and noticed a lack of competitive and aggressive behavior, which made it very difficult to identify a ranking order. But finally, the researchers were confident of having found the alpha male. After a while, this specific bird disappeared for unknown reasons. Again, the researchers had to identify the new alpha male. It took some time before they announced the new number one in their colony. And then they speculated a lot about one amazing fact. The new alpha male was bonded to the same female bird as his predecessor. What characteristics made this female so attractive to an alpha male? Any idea? The researchers didn't see what was right before their eyes. The alpha individual never disappeared. She was always there. But Darwin's, uh, or, or the, this, the image, a biological image of male dominance, it goes back to Charles Darwin, was so strong that it blocked the simple explanation of a female hierarchy in the colony. 
And at this point, I, un I really understood the power of a bias. And ever since, my concept of science is more complete. Good science requires good questions in order to find new answers and new solutions. But good, good science also requires the readiness to change one's perspective again and again in order to get a wider view. You see this, this leopard. I took this photo some years ago in Kenya. And I hope you can see that the leopard is alert. He's obviously staring at something. But from my point of view, I couldn't see anything. I wanted to know. So I started circling around, changed my position, and then came across this little antelope. But I could see that the leopard was not staring in its direction. So I had to go on again, circle around, find a new position, a new angle. I found this bunch of tourist cars. And you know, although all these intrusive observers were watching the leopard, the leopard was not interested in them. He looked into a different direction. So again, I had to circle around, find another position, a new perspective. Came across this lioness. And now I could see that the leopard was directly staring at this lioness. In the beginning, when I first saw the leopard, I could only speculate about the reason for his behavior. But after circling around, changing my position, my perspective again and again, I could derive that it was neither hunger nor annoyance. He was simply afraid of a dangerous competitor. Let me return to Charles Darwin. Charles Darwin did not question the alleged inferiority of women, but he successfully overcame the idea of a special position of humans in nature. He had a new viewpoint. Instead of a top-down standpoint, he had a bottom-up view at the origin of species. He changed the paradigm because he changed his perspective. And this approach is not restricted to science. Everyone can use it in day-to-day -day life. I am out of research business for 14 years now, but I never forgot my lesson learned. I had to face many new challenges and I found many new solutions, new answers. I was successful because I changed my perspective. I always look at problems from different perspectives. And I personally, particularly, love perspectives that appear to be a little bit crazy, a little bit weird, like the idea that Darwin had been a woman. Thank you.